Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Jonathan. For questions one to twelve, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Jonathan. Tell me about your problem. I am having severe and recurrent jaw pain, doctor. There is also numbness, tingling along the jaw, teeth, and tongue. How long have you had these problems? For the past six months. I even consulted a dentist, but the dental evaluations are normal. I was also diagnosed with a throat infection last week, and I was prescribed Avalox, which I've almost completed. I am taking cough drops and trying to increase fluids. Oh, I see. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. But I used to chew tobacco for about thirty years, but I've recently stopped. Okay. Moreover, I've also lost the sensation of taste. The numbness is on the left lateral tongue and jaw that extends from the angle of the jaw to my lip, doctor. Recently, I've gained about twenty pounds of weight, and that may be due to decreased activity. Do you get headaches? Yes, doctor. About twice in a month. Do you experience any fever or chills? No, doctor. Do you have any tooth pain, especially while biting? No, doctor. Have you had any jaw popping? No, doctor. Any spasm of the jaw, that is trismus? No, doctor. I've stopped chewing tobacco, and I'm using Nicorec gum now, doctor. Okay. Uh, what's your age now? Fifty years. Have you ever had any surgery? Yes, pertinent for hernia repair surgery. What medications are you taking at the moment? Tylenol, and I'm on Nicorette gum. Are you allergic to any medicine? Yes, I'm allergic to codeine. I used to feel dizzy or lightheaded when I took codeine. Hmm. Your blood pressure is one thirty-eight over eighty-two. Pulse sixty-four and normal. Temperature ninety-eight point three, and your weight is a hundred ninety-one pounds. Your oral cavity is normal with good moisture. You have a slightly decreased sensation to your left jaw that extends to the left lateral tongue and left intrabuchal mucosa. The fiber optic nasopharyngoscopy reveals a moderately deviated nasal septum to the left. Large inferior terminates. You have developed persistent paresthesia of the left manual teeth and tongue, possibly neoplasm within the mandible. You have also developed hypogeusia with loss of taste and dry mouth syndrome called xerostomia. I would suggest you have a CT of your head, including sinuses and mandible, so that I can evaluate and make sure you have not developed neoplasm. Take plenty of fluids and come and see me again when you get your diagnose reports. You hear a urologist talking to a patient named Mark Jenkins. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at your notes.
Hi, come in. It's Mr. Jenkins, right? Yes, Mark's fine. Sure. Now, Mark, you've been referred to me because you're suffering from urinary incontinence. Yeah, that's right. And you're 38 years of age? Yes. Okay. Well, I have your GP's letter here, but I'd like you to tell me more about this. How long you've had the symptoms, how it's affecting your life, that type of thing. Sure. Well, it's been going on now for about two months, actually. A little longer, I think. At first, I resisted going to see my doctor. I mean, I'm not that old yet and reasonably fit and healthy. And frankly, I was more than a little embarrassed. A guy my age doesn't usually expect to have the same issues as a man twice my age. But eventually it just became too much for me to take, and that's when I sought some advice. Sometimes I could feel it coming, but most of the time it was a sudden burst, so to speak. Okay. Was there a particular trigger? Basically what happened was I'd recently started a class of CrossFit training. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's all performed at a high intensity and crosses over various disciplines like weightlifting, rowing, gymnastic type movements, that sort of thing. Well, every time I went to class, I had this really heavy pressure on my bladder. Eventually, right in the middle of weight training, it became so strong that I had no control over it. It just leaked out while I was doing it. Later, I noticed that it'd also come on if I had severe coughing fits. That's understandable. And your doctor did some tests? Yeah, so my GP's a great guy, and he was really professional about it. I had a prostate exam, the results of which are apparently fine, and it's a normal size and everything. He also got me to keep what he called a bladder diary for a full day and night, which was fine. I recorded how often I went to the toilet normally, and also the occasions that I didn't have control. I have all that here for you. Right, that's certainly helpful. Look, you're obviously very fit, but could you tell me some more about your health, especially any past conditions, operations, or if you've ever smoked, that kind of thing? Well, up until five years ago, I was quite heavy. I'm only 170 centimeters tall, and I used to weigh 135 kilograms, so that gives you some idea. I think my BMI was 46 or 47, so I was classified as obese. I haven't had any operations, but my GP at the time confirmed that I had pre-diabetes, which really scared me. I was a pack-a-day smoker, but usually more. I was also a heavy dope smoker, and I was in an office job. That's what caused me to overhaul my life, change to a very physical job, and get myself to the gym. What do you do for a living now, then, Mark? I'm a roof tiler. So you can imagine what that's like, being on top of a three-story building and suddenly needing to go. It's not an easy job to begin with, and this is making it 50 times worse. And has that affected your social life at all? Look, if I'm completely honest with you, my bladder seems to be controlling every aspect of my life. I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but that's how it feels to me. I've already lost a relationship over it, so now I'm single. But I'm still young enough to be out dating and all of that. But the fear that this condition has left me with means that I don't really meet friends very often. It's an enormous burden. I was stuck in a line at a bank the other day and had to leave with a very noticeable wet patch on my pants. I'm scared to leave my home. It can be very burdensome, I know. The good thing is you've taken steps to fix it. So what I'll ask you to do now... Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse talking to her colleague about a patient's request to leave the ward. 
Now read the question. Mr. Jenkins really shouldn't be going anywhere at the moment. Well, it's only to the coffee shop downstairs, and he's mobile, so... He can certainly do minor things like showering and getting back and forth to the toilet by himself, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's up to leaving the ward. He's going a little stir crazy, and he's been in the ward now for weeks. He needs to feel like a normal person again. Of course he does, but we can't jeopardize his safety. I realize he believes he can, but I really think it's beyond his capability right now. I'm happy to go with him if it'll ease your mind. I'd really prefer if he just holds off until he gets the tick of approval. We don't want him undoing all the effort for a cup of coffee. You hear a paramedic briefing a doctor on a recent emergency admission. Now read the question. Mr. Teagan has suffered suspected second-degree burns from boiling oil to the back of both hands and forearms. He works as an apprentice chef and was lifting a pot of oil when he slipped, inadvertently scolding himself. Apparently, he panicked and his co-workers were forced to hold his arms under cool running water until we arrived at the scene. They also managed to contact his wife, who's on her way. You may appreciate her assistance as he's very distressed and obviously frightened. My colleague has managed to administer oxygen and gave 2.5 milligrams of morphine, but that was as far as he got, as Mr. Teagan continued to put up quite a struggle en route, which is something you'll need to consider before any further treatment. Pain is well controlled at present. You hear an anaesthetist talking with a patient prior to her surgery. Now read the question. So, Mrs. Simpson, do you have any questions before we go into the theatre? Uh, I'm sorry. I think I'm just a little nervous. Everything you told me earlier has gone in one ear and out the other. I see. It's perfectly normal to be anxious before major surgery. Well, if I'm going to be under for such a long time, it just worries me that anything could happen. I know there are dangers involved with it, and I think I'm prepared for that. But how will it leave me feeling? I, I mean, well, I'm really not looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of rehab and really training myself to walk again. I'm just not sure if I'm up to the challenge. How can I possibly go through all of that when I'm in such agony? It just doesn't seem possible. It's such a long process. You hear a trainee doctor telling her supervisor about an uncomfortable situation she recently encountered with an end-of-life patient. Now read the question. Would you mind if we talk about Mr. Harris in bed six? Sure. Is there a problem? No, nothing like that. The ICU nurse asked me to talk with the patient's family about his situation. I mean, basically explain to them that there's nothing else we can really do for him and that he likely won't survive. How did it go? Horribly. They were asking what they should do next, what steps to take. I could barely keep myself together. It was just so hard to talk with them just staring at me like that with such blank expressions. It was the hardest thing I've ever encountered. I honestly don't think I'm cut out for situations like that. I assure you, it's perfectly normal in such a predicament. You hear a nurse briefing a colleague at the end of her shift. Now read the question.
So in bed five is Mr. Benjamin Higgins, 75 years of age, under Dr. Munro. He had elective angioplasty and insertion of stent via the left femoral artery this morning at 9 a.m. He has a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and angina. His medications are metaprolol twice a day, simvastatin, and glycerol trinitrate single spray. He has no known allergies. With regards to the operation, there were no complications, and he returned to the ward today at 11.30 a.m. Did he have any pain at all? He did, just 3 out of 10, mild discomfort. I tried to call Dr. Munro, but he was in theatre. But his secretary said she'll pass it on. He has to remain supine until 5 p.m. today, and his wife will have to be informed of his progress. When I received him, he was alert and orientated, and his vitals were within normal range. ECG is normal sinus rhythm, and that was at 11.45. You hear a veterinarian and the owner of a cat discussing how to give insulin to her pet. Now read the question. So I'll just explain a little on the initial steps of administering the insulin. Okay. It's really very simple. So the first thing is the insulin needs to stay in the refrigerator. Now Felix is getting two units, twice per day. So what I suggest is marking it on a calendar for each day. So divide the day in half with a line. I'd recommend drawing a little box in each section so you can give it a big tick for both morning and evening doses. The one thing you don't want to do is double-dose the insulin. So you turn the bottle upside down and roll it gently, don't shake it, and then take out a syringe. What happens if you shake it? I could potentially destroy it, so you want to try to avoid that. Okay, sure. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions 31 to 36. You hear a geriatrician called Dr. Claire Cox giving a presentation on the subject of end-of-life care for people with dementia. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
My name's Dr. Claire Cox. I'm a geriatrician specializing in palliative care. My topic today is an increasingly important issue, end-of-life care for dementia patients. The care of dementia patients presents certain problems. Dementia is a terminal illness and is the third highest cause of death in Australia. Different from other such conditions, it has an unpredictable trajectory and there can be difficult issues around patients' mental capacity, decision-making and communication. But, in spite of an equal need for palliative care services, dementia patients don't always fit the traditional model of such care. Families often suffer distress because they feel unable to ensure that their loved one's wishes are being respected or just don't know what that person wanted because the discussion wasn't held early enough. There is therefore a clear need for well-funded, patient-centred palliative dementia care that's available when and where it's needed. I do a lot of work with Dementia Australia, an organisation which represents the needs of Australians living with all types of dementia and of their families and carers. It also campaigns on dementia issues and funds research. Dementia Australia decided it was the right time to examine the issue of end-of-life dementia care from the perspective of the consumer as well as from that of the healthcare professional. It's a timely initiative. We have plenty of anecdotal evidence but not enough hard facts about what's going wrong and why the system's failing. But the current situation isn't all bad. Despite the issues I've mentioned, I've heard some wonderful examples of how it has made a big difference to people's lives. Things can obviously go badly wrong if this isn't handled well. But in the right circumstances, people with dementia can reach the end of their lives peacefully and with dignity. Dementia Australia commissioned researchers to conduct a survey on the end-of-life issues affecting dementia patients. The survey covered both care professionals, that's doctors, nurses and others working with dementia patients, as well as family member carers. The interest was overwhelming with more than a thousand responses from around Australia. But what do the results tell us? Well, the initial results confirmed what we've heard about access to appropriate end-of-life care. It was obvious immediately that there was a between the perceptions of care professionals and family member carers about end-of-life dementia care. For instance, while 58% of family member carers said that they didn't have access to palliative care specialists and 68% didn't have access to hospices, Three quarters of care professionals indicated that people with dementia in their area do in fact have access to palliative care. This begs the question of whether consumers, that is patients and family member carers, might not be aware of services that are available. Another notable finding of the survey was that care professionals often lack knowledge of the legal issues surrounding end-of-life care. Some reports indicate that care professionals are at times reluctant to use pain medications such as morphine because of concerns about hastening a patient's death. However, access to appropriate pain relief is considered to be a fundamental human right, even if death is earlier as a secondary effect of medication. Our survey found that 27% of care professionals were unsure about this or didn't believe that patients are legally entitled to adequate pain control, if it might hasten death. So perhaps it isn't surprising then that a quarter of former family member carers felt that pain wasn't... This lack of awareness extends beyond pain management. The statistics on refusing treatment were particularly... Almost a third of care professionals were unaware that people have the right to refuse food and hydration, and one in ten also thought refusal of antibiotics wasn't an option for patients in end-of-life care. How can we ever achieve consumer empowerment and consumer-directed care if the professionals are so ill-informed? There's a clear need for greater information and training on patients' rights. Yet over a third of care professionals 
said they hadn't received any such training at all. It's obvious that end-of-life care planning is desirable. Discussing and documenting preferences is clearly the best way of minimising the burden of decision-making on carers and ensuring patients' wishes are respected. Advanced care planning is essentially an insurance policy that helps to protect our patients in case they lose their decision-making capacity. Even though a patient might believe that loved ones will have their best interests at heart, the evidence shows that such people aren't that good at knowing what decisions those they love would make on complex matters such as infection control and hydration. So before I go on... Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a specialist in health and nutrition called Dr. Gregor McGregor discussing the ideal healthy diet for humans. For questions 37 to 42, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Good evening, I'm Dr. Gregor McGregor. In this talk, I want to discuss what we know about a healthy diet and confront some of the misinformation that gets passed around about what types of food are better or worse for us. So let's get right to it. What is the healthiest diet? Well, the best available balance of evidence suggests that the healthiest diet is one centered around fruits, vegetables, legumes or beans, split peas, chickpeas and lentils, whole grains and nuts, basically real food that grows out of the ground. This is our healthiest choice. And all the while minimizing our intake of meat, eggs, dairy and processed junk. So plant-based. A plant-based diet centered around whole plant foods. That's the secret. But of course, it isn't really a secret. And I don't think anyone listening will be surprised to hear this. So what's the issue here? Why is there so much debate around this issue when the evidence seems so clear? A part of the problem, seems to me, is diets and what might be called the dieting industry. I mean, diets, by definition, don't work, right? Because you go on them, then you go off. What we need is a lifestyle. What we need is a way to eat and live so that we can live a long, healthy life. And to do that, thankfully, the same diet that's associated with longevity is the same diet that's so effective in controlling weight. 
But there's so much discussion out there online about what's better or worse to eat. There's a lot of conflicting information out there backing up different sides. For example, there is information saying meat is good for you, eggs are good for you, dairy is good for you. And it's really confusing people because it seems to be like no matter what you believe in, you'll find the proof to back it up. But of course, the proof that meat is good for you is backed up by the meat industry, right? That eggs are good for us, backed up by the egg industry. I mean, this is a classic kind of tobacco industry tactic. The tobacco industry really pioneered the tactics that different interest groups in the food industry use all the time now. The tobacco industry was the first to use science against itself. This was one of their great innovations. This is, you know, in the 1940s and 50s. Basically, they realized that science was venerated, as it should be, as a way of, to kind of sift through what is true and what's not. And the public believed that. And when there was this tremendous body of literature starting in the 1930s and certainly around the 1950s, that, you know, non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer risk than smokers. I mean, by the time the U.S. Surgeon General's report in the 1960s, uh, 1964, came out, they had 7,000 studies all showing in some way the health risks associated with smoking. So you'd think that after the first few thousand research studies came out, somebody in the government would do something about it, right? But tobacco was a very powerful industry. I mean, it took that much, that overwhelming mass of evidence, to finally get the powers that be to just recognize that smoking was killing people. And the tobacco industry tactic was to fund their own science. They have this tobacco institute where they fund their own scientists just to instill doubt. They knew they couldn't go up against 7,000 studies. In fact, there's a famous tobacco industry memo called Doubt is Our Product. And this was a PR company saying, all we have to do is introduce enough doubt. You know, some scientists say tobacco is good, some say it's bad, so who knows? And so the food industry is the same. The hope is that all the contradictory evidence and confusion makes people just kind of throw up their hands in the air and eat whatever is put in front of them. So this is good for the trillion dollar food industry, but it's not good for our health and well-being. And we do have a lot of evidence suggesting diets heavy in meat and dairy are not very good for you. The most powerful data we have are these interventional studies. For example, you look at the longest, healthiest living populations around the world, the so-called blue zones, with the most centenarians, people living over a hundred. You know, whether it's Okinawa in Japan, Seventh-day Adventists in the USA, or Nicoya in Costa Rica. If you do a Venn diagram of all these blue zones, what they share in common is a plant-based diet, and specifically legumes. For example, Okinawa, the second longest living population in the world, they have a 97% plant-based diet. 